In the previous lectures on the band structures of three-dimensional solids, we limited ourselves to elemental solids. In this lecture, we're going to expand out to crystals that have more than one element. And at the same time, we're going to introduce a transition metal ions that have d orbitals. Now, if I would take you back to this slide, which is the slide I used to introduce our whole study of electronic band structure, at that point in time, I said the goal is to go from this molecular orbital diagram. Here, the molecular orbital diagram on the left is for an octahedron to a three-dimensional solid that has this band structure diagram. And the illustrated band structure diagram I used in that first slide of chapter six was the band structure diagram for rhenium trioxide. So now we are in a position to look at this and to understand this band structure diagram. And I think we can feel good about that progress. Let's start with the crystal structure. So rhenium trioxide, which we talked about back in chapter one, has a primitive cubic Bravais lattice. It's a very simple structure. We're gonna put a metal on each corner of the unit cell, and then we're gonna put an oxygen at the center of each edge of the unit cell. And if we were to build out multiple unit cells, we get this structure shown over here on the left, which is an infinite network of corner connected octahedra. So each rhenium is six coordinate and each oxygen is two coordinate. Rhenium trioxide itself is kind of an exceptional compound from the point of view of its electrical conductivity. In this table on the lower right, I'm comparing the room temperature conductivity of rhenium trioxide with several metals. So we can see it's not as conductive as the most conductive metals like silver and copper. But on the other hand, it's substantially more conductive than early transition metals like titanium or manganese or even post-transition metals like bismuth. For an oxide compound, which we would normally think of as being an ionic compound, it has exceptional electrical conductivity. Now the rhenium trioxide structure is very closely related to the perovskite structure. And in this view here, you can see that similarity. Basically, if we look at a perovskite like strontium titanate, the only difference is that we've added a large electropositive cation, here strontium, at the middle of the unit cell in that cube octahedral cage. Now, typically, that large cation is rather electropositive, and so the bonds it makes with the anions are quite ionic. And if we take that to the limit, we could say, well, the strontium is just there to give up its two electrons to the titanium oxide framework. And in that approximation, the band structure of a perovskite becomes completely analogous with the band structures of compounds that have the rhenium trioxide structure. So we're going to treat these basically as the same. One really nice thing about the band structure here is we're back to a primitive cubic lattice. And so we have this simple, easy to understand primitive cubic first Brillouin zone. And remember, we talked about this first Brillouin zone in our first lecture on the structures of three-dimensional crystals when we talked about alpha polonium. So if you're a little bit confused on the special points, I would suggest you go back to that lecture. All right, here's our molecular orbital diagram for a rhenium-centered octahedron. Now, we covered this back in Chapter 6, but remember that if we neglect the oxygen 2s orbitals for the time being, we're going to have 6 times 3, 18 different oxygen 2p salcs. And then on the central rhenium, we're going to have 5d orbitals, and then the higher lying 6s and 6p orbitals. So on coming from lowest to highest energy, we start with these orbitals down here, which are rhenium oxygen bonding MOs. And then as we move upward in energy, we find that there are oxygen salcs that don't bind 
uh, partner on the rhenium to make a bonding MO. And so these are non-bonding oxygen 2P molecular orbitals. Then we get into the anti-bonding rhenium 5D oxygen 2P states. And those are split by the octahedral crystal field into triply degenerate T2G that has pi antibonding character and a doubly degenerate EG, which has sigma antibonding character. And then at higher energy still, we find the antibonding 6S and the antibonding 6P states. Now, in everything that follows, we're going to focus predominantly on the orbitals that are closer to the Fermi level, closer to the HOMO and the LUMO. So we're just going to look at these oxygen 2P bands and these rhenium 5D bands. Now, the molecular orbital diagram is not a reliable place to figure out how many bands we're going to have in our band structure. And the reason why is because the rhenium to oxygen ratio in an isolated octahedron is different than it is in this extended solid where the oxygens are shared by more than one octahedron. But if we think about our unit cell, we have one rhenium atom and three oxygen atoms per unit cell. So that means we're going to have three bands that come from the oxygen 2S orbitals. Three times three, nine bands that come from the oxygen 2P orbitals. Five rhenium 5D bands, three rhenium 6P bands, and one rhenium 6S bands. So let's neglect the really low-lying oxygen 2S states and then also the bands that come from the 6S and the 6P orbitals, just focusing on the oxygen 2P bands and the rhenium 5D bands. And if we do that, we could calculate a band structure for rhenium trioxide that looks like this. And so you see at the bottom what I've labeled as the oxygen 2P bands. It's not entirely easy to see, but there are nine bands here. There have to be nine bands because there's three oxygens and each oxygen has three P orbitals. Um, we can see in some places where the energy is high, that would correspond to bands that are entirely or largely oxygen 2P non-bonding. But then we see in other places the energy goes down pretty substantially. I mean, the width of these bands is about eight electron volts. And that reduction in the energies of these bands is due to bonding interactions with the rhenium. Then we come to three bands that have rhenium 5D parentage. These are the T2G bands that come from the DXY, the DXZ, and the DYZ orbitals. As a general descriptor, we can call these the pi star bands. Because rhenium 6 plus is a D1 ion, we know that these bands are going to be partially filled. They're going to be one-sixth of the way filled. And so that's why the Fermi level cuts through these bands. And then at the highest energy, we find more rhenium 5D bands, and these come from the dx squared minus y squared and the dz squared orbitals, the eg set of orbitals that are sigma antibonding. Let's go through and look at the crystal orbitals at various special points. So if we start with the sigma star bands, that's the highest energy set here, and let's go to gamma. Here I'm showing the orbital overlap between the dx squared minus y squared band and the oxygen. And as we discussed when we did our copper oxygen layer, the 2p orbitals on oxygen cannot mix with the dx squared minus y squared band at gamma but we do get a, some contribution from the oxygen 2S, which I've shown here. And so that makes this crystal orbital weakly antibonding. If we were to move to the M point, we can see that the energy goes uphill substantially. And if we look at the crystal orbital, we can find that it is sigma antibonding at M. And so this large increase in the energy, which leads to quite a wide band, is due to the change from a state that is weakly antibonding between rhenium dx squared minus y squared oxygen 2s. And the weakness of the bonding is because the oxygen 2s orbital has a really poor energetic overlap with the rhenium 5d.
Remember that the oxygen 2s states are tens of electron volts below the oxygen 2p states in energy. But when we get to m, now the 2p orbitals, which have a good energetic overlap with rhenium 5d, can interact in this sigma star fashion. And so that's why the band goes uphill in energy. This analysis also allows us to say that of the two bands in the sigma star region, this band must be the dx squared minus y squared, which means by default, the other band here must be the dz squared. We see that they're degenerate at gamma, and they become degenerate again at r. Let me just take a minute to point out that if I'm going a little too quickly with the orbital overlap arguments here, I would encourage you to go back to our lecture on the electronic structure of the copper oxide layers, because the overlap in those CuO2 layers is almost entirely analogous to what's happening here in the xy plane. Let's now move on to the T2g bands, the pi star bands. And so if we look at gamma, we find that the dxy orbital by symmetry cannot overlap at all with the oxygen 2p orbitals, nor with the oxygen 2s orbitals. So this band is entirely rhenium 5d non-bonding. And I don't show the pictures here, but if we were to look at the DXZ and the DYZ bands, they would also be completely non-bonding in character, and that's why all three bands are degenerate at gamma. If we move to the M point, now we can get this anti-bonding pi character. And so that leads to a significant increase in the energy. At gamma and at R, right, that's where we... Don't change the phase of the orbital at all from one unit cell to the next to R, where we change the phase of the orbital every time we translate by one unit cell in any direction. But at those two points, these three orbitals are degenerate. Finally, we can look at a couple of crystal orbitals that come from the highest energy bands in the oxygen 2p set of bands. These are the ones that are mostly non-bonding. So if we were to look at gamma, we could look at this orbital. And you, know, you can see, if you look for a minute at this orbital, that first of all, it's not bonding or anti-bonding with respect to overlap of the different oxygens with one another. Um, if we try and put in some kind of a orbital here on the rhenium, you know, an S orbital is not going to overlap with it. Uh, the p orbital will not have any sigma overlap with these crystal orbitals. Uh, none of the d states can overlap. So this is a non-bonding oxygen 2p state. If we were to move to the m point, now we're going to change the phase of our orbitals as we move in either the x or the y direction through the crystal. But that doesn't change the basic picture. These orbitals don't have the right symmetry to mix with the rhenium d p or s orbitals. One can imagine if you look at this long enough that you could have in the upper drawing a little bit of pi overlap with the rhenium p orbital. But that interaction is going to be very, very weak. But that's enough to explain why we get just a slight change in energy when we go from gamma to m to r. This perovskite band structure is kind of special because if we look at certain energy differences, we can learn important things about the bonding here. If we were to go to the R point, where both the T2g and the EG orbitals are entirely anti-bonding with their neighboring oxygens, well, the energy splitting between these two sets of orbitals is exactly the same thing as the octahedral ligand field splitting. Right? So in that MO diagram of the molecule, the splitting we saw between the T2g and the EG antibonding orbitals is going to be exactly this energy in the three-dimensional band structure. If we were to go to gamma, remember I showed you that at gamma, the oxygen 2p states are non-bonding and the rhenium 5d states are non-bonding. And so this energy difference here is almost a perfect charge transfer energy 
to take an electron from a non-bonding oxygen orbital to a non-bonding rhenium orbital. Now you might ask the question, why don't the sigma star bands come down to this non-bonding state here? And the reason why they don't is because of that anti-bonding interaction with the oxygen 2s. And so you can see that that's not insignificant because it raises the energy here by several electron volts. And finally, we can look at the difference in energy between the highest lying state in the oxygen 2p bands and the lowest lying state in the rhenium 5d bands. That's not at gamma. That's actually from R to gamma. So this isn't particularly important for rhenium trioxide because the Fermi level is cutting through the bands up here. But when we go to perovskites or REO3 structures where the central transition metal has a D0 configuration, this will become the band gap. Uh, so something like strontium titanate. So in that case, you're going from oxygen to titanium. And so we can see that the band gap of compounds with the perovskite or the rhenium trioxide structures are inherently indirect because we never have the valence band maximum and the conduction band minimum at the same point. Now let's go just a little bit deeper and think about some periodic trends. So we're going to use those special transition energies that I showed on the last slide. We're going to look here at four different cubic metal oxygen frameworks. And what I've done is to steadily work from right to left across the periodic table. So rhenium, one element to the left of rhenium is tungsten, then tantalum, and then hafnium. The charge of our central cation is 6 plus for these two uh, rhenium trioxide structures, but then 5 plus for potassium tantalate, 4 plus for barium hafnate. So what happens to the band structure when we make these subtle changes? I mean, qualitatively, it doesn't change at all. But there are some differences because we're changing the electronegativity of the central metal atom, and we're also changing the metal oxygen bond distances. And what we can see is that as the effective nuclear charge is decreasing, we see that the metal oxygen bond distance increases. We could say that there's less covalency between the metal and the oxygen. That's not too surprising, but that's going to do two things. Because the covalency is decreasing, the difference between a non-bonding crystal orbital and an anti-bonding crystal orbital is going to get smaller because the anti-bonding crystal orbital is going to be less anti-bonding. And we can see that if we look at the widths of the sigma star and pi star bands. They decrease as we make the bonds more ionic. And at the same time, we're also making them longer, which decreases the spatial overlap. We see the same trend for our octahedral ligand field splitting. Right, that's decreasing. And uh, we also see that the charge transfer energy is increasing. This doesn't have really that much to do with the covalency of the bonds, but just with the overall electronegativity of the central metal. And so you can see that the changes when you go from rhenium, three elements to the left, to hafnium are not small. These bonds are much, much more ionic in the hafnium case than they were in the rhenium case. And not surprisingly, that leads to an increase in the band gap of these D0 systems because that band gap is really an oxygen to metal charge transfer, at least in an approximate sense. What happens when we move vertically in the periodic table? So I'm going to keep barium hafnate, and now I'm going to add strontium titanate. Titanium and hafnium are both in group four. All right, that's titanium, zirconium, hafnium. And we see some things are the same, but some things are a little different here. Now, if we were to think about the electronegativity, actually sometimes when you move vertically in the transition metals, it's not that obvious how the electronegativity should change. So let's look at our charge transfer energy here. Our charge transfer energy goes from 4.1 strontium titanate to 5.3 in barium hafnate. So what that's telling us is that titanium is more electronegative than hafnium. So the energetic overlap 
between titanium and oxygen is better than the energetic overlap between hafnium and oxygen. However, we also see that the bandwidth of the bands we see in barium hafnate is larger than what the bandwidth we see in the strontium titanate case, even though the energetic overlap is poorer. And the reason for that is because something we talked about back in chapter 5, the 5D orbitals are going to extend out considerably farther from the nucleus than the 3D orbitals on titanium. So we get more spatial overlap between the metal and the oxygen. And that increased spatial overlap is enough that it gives us wider bands. So we kind of have competing trends going on here. It's good to remember these competing trends when we come to the electrical properties of perovskites, which we're going to talk about shortly. And things like the bandwidth and the charge transfer energy are going to be really important in determining whether we have localized electrons or delocalized electrons.